the future of fecal transplants. Like it does seem like there's something interesting there. Like if you can, when, the more we learn about the microbiome and the more we figure out how to kind of cultivate a very bespoke ecology for a particular individual, um, the idea of these fecal transplants seems to be a really good idea. I think it's a great idea, and but I would say that the hope and hype we had 10 years ago hasn't played out as much as I would have hoped. Mm -hmm. um, it is the number one treatment for a couple of conditions, mainly really bad infections and uh, something called recurrent C. diff, Clostridium difficile. You get recurrent diarrhea 30 times a day, usually caused by antibiotics overuse. That is 90% of the time cured by a, sing you know, a single uh, transfusion of a healthy donor uh, stool sample. But there are not many uh, other conditions where it's shown to be nearly as effective. Mm. And the early hope that it would be a, a, a cure for obesity has been shown to be false. So you can't take someone's skinny, skinny feces and put them into uh, uh, an obese person and make them skinny. It doesn't work. Um, but isn't there, there's some indicia around cravings though, aren't, isn't there with this or no? There are- Or autoimmune diseases. Well, it, it does work in a proportion of people with ulcerative colitis, which is an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So that's the other uh, hope because there's at least one disease where um, I think it's about one in four or one in five people have remission. So they, it's like there's, you know, there's no sign of the disease after it, which is pretty much as good as the drugs, the, the medicines, the immunotherapies that they're given, which is, is pretty good. But it doesn't work for other related conditions um, other autoimmune conditions doesn't seem to work nearly as well. So we don't really understand what it is. And it, it could be that, you know, the microbiome of the host, the person who's, you know, the sick person has to be so bad, there's actually nothing there mm -hmm. in order for the new microbes to colonize and take over. And if it's too stable, it's really hard to mm. gain a hold. Plus the fact we haven't matched up the donor and the recipient very well and we don't know what the magic factors are. Mm -hmm. So I think there's still time to do it, but I think uh, it's not looking as hopeful as it was um, perhaps 10 years ago to be you know, the cure-all for everything. But the exceptions to this are in cancer, where they've done a, tell you, a couple of cases of people who survived metastatic melanoma, responded very well to immunotherapy, and they took their, their stool sample and they gave that to people who'd failed immunotherapy and were about to die. Mm. And a, a reasonable proportion of them were rescued. Wow. So um, there could be very specific cases for people who have very bad microbes where um, they just need that extra shot to, to, to improve them. Mm -hmm. So I think we're still finding our way and um, trying to get around this idea that because we're so different, it's very hard to come up with a sort of one size fits all solution and they don't quite know whether to get 10 donors and put them all in a you know a magic mix and uh, and serve up that soup or they should be specifically looking for certain microbes or you should be artificially producing these um fecal transplants and there are trials going many right. trials going on artificially to look at it but so i think cancer is the one area of the most hope and excitement and going back to the idea, I think it, in the not too distant future, everyone's going to be storing their stool sample, maybe to use when they have cancer treatment, mm -hmm. um, give themselves the best chance, and you know, storing up the the people who've successfully fought off cancer against the odds and worked out what it is about those those uh, microbes that are so good at helping that person's immune yeah, yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. It's, yeah, it, it's. Um, a nuanced game, as we say, but I think we were misled because a lot of people thought it was a cure for obesity. Right. That um, a lot of people um, were doing this on the internet. Oh, and, well. uh, You know, sort of, uh, <laughs> and, and had some really bad results. Uh -huh. um, another uh, source of confusion uh, surrounds 
the importance or lack thereof of of fermented foods. We talked about the 30 plants a week thing. Um, I think there's a lot of people who think as long as I'm getting some fermented foods in my diet on some kind of regular basis, I don't have to worry as much about the 30 plants a week or the diversity of, of the foods that I'm eating. How important is the fermented food piece? And then on top of that, how do we know that the kind of cultures the fermented cultures that are in these foods are actually efficacious. We were talking about kombucha before the podcast or in these yogurts or these kefirs. It'll say, you know, it has this and that in it, but, you know, what is the pasteurization process? Like, do these cultures, you know, persist through the manufacturing and distribution process of these foods such that they have any kind of viability once, you know, they're consumed? So lots of questions there. The, um, I think the first first one is I think to build a healthy gut microbiome, you've got to get the diversity of plants in there as your number That's one. That's number one. If you don't eat plants, I don't any amount of fermented food is going to really help you because the uh, probiotic microbes in the fermented food don't actually stay in your gut very long. They pass through and they as they're passing through, they stimulate um, the other microbes to produce helpful chemicals. We don't exactly understand that because, but we know that the microbes, for example, in kefir or yogurt, or these lactobacilli, they're designed to live in yog milk and, and yogurt, not in your mm -hmm. intestine mm -hmm. long term. So they pass through and they have to have an, a sort of collateral effect on that environment. They just, for reasons we don't still understand, they, they make them produce better chemicals. We discussed these pharmacy idea. They're sort of boosting the pharmacy to produce those chemicals for you is the, is the current idea of what, what they do. And obviously, the, the greater the diversity of the microbes that are doing that, the better your chance of it working. That's why kefir has more microbes than yogurt, uh, perhaps 10 times more different species. It's a more complex um, uh, fermented food. Uh, and cheese, you know, often has only two or three uh, microbial species, unless you get some exotic French ones, which are often illegal in the, in the US because they're, they're, they're too dangerous. Um, and then you've got uh, things like kimchi, uh, where the fermented food is, you've got the microbes which are eating the, the cabbage and the garlic and the and the, mm -hmm. and the chilies, and there may be maybe thirty different microbes in there, including yeast and fungi. And the difference with those foods is that they're also prebiotic because you're also eating the the plants that are nourishing the microbes. So they will probably hang around a bit longer than say just your mm -hmm. kefir or your yogurt or your cheese ones. Um, so, and the kombuchas are similarly complex, often uh, between 10 and 30 different microbe species. Um, but um, how do you tell that? So you want to steady, so little and often is the rule. So there's no point having a big once a, a week feast. You want to have a small little shots. And I think the study suggesting that if you can get three small portions a day, that's probably pretty ideal of, of different types of these fermented foods. And how do you tell uh, what the best products are? It's really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, we were discussing kombuchas and, you know, I was in a, a store uh, with Will. We were, we were looking at some of these range, great range of kombuchas in California, but some of them just at the bottom just say, oh, gently pasteurized. Right. So it's dead. So probably if it's a little use, although there is some evidence there are some microbes that do work when they're pasteurized, but I don't think these ones mm -hmm. have been proven to work. And so checking whether it's been pasteurized, checking its, um, the date, how long its shelf life is. If it's, if it's live, it's not going to have a really long shelf life. And so you, you pick up a kombucha, you want to see whether there's any sediment in the bottom. Is there something like a mini blob in there that's, that could form? And like, and similarly, um, other products, if you're taking kimchi or sauerkraut, make sure it's not in vinegar, 
It's actually live and it says live microbes on it. Hasn't, again, make sure it hasn't been pasteurized even gently. And the, the ultimate test is probably to try some of these, either get a brand you really know and can trust, and, and if you don't know them, test them. You, know, you, can, you can take the sediment of a kombucha and if you put that into a bit of tea and sugar and leave it for a week, mm -hmm. uh, you'll know whether it's real or not. <laughs> Similarly, yeah. if you take the end of a kefir, um, if it's live, it should, if you pour it into a glass of milk, within 24 hours, that should have turned into kefir. So there are ways of, of, of actually doing your own little practical experiments to, to work this out, but it's, it's a real um, uh, problem for the consumer at mm -hmm. the moment. There isn't Right, like the consumer shouldn't you. have to do that, you no. know, to figure this out. Like we, we shouldn't have to run our own experiments to validate whatever's on a label or and, isn't. And beware of artificial sweeteners as well in, in a lot of these products because we know they're harmful for the gut microbes as well. So you're doing some mm -hmm. good and some bad. You might, you know, have to bit off, put up with a little bit of sugar, not too sweet, uh, rather than having artificial chemicals, which uh, will have a negative effect on the on the gut mm -hmm. microbes. And what about a proper probiotic, not as a replacement for a healthy, robust, diverse diet, but as something, as sort of a cherry on top. Um, in the book, there, there's a study that you talk about with respect to um, uh, COVID and kind of outcomes around, uh, you know, populations that were on a probiotic versus not on a probiotic. So where's your thinking around that? Because there's also a lot of confusion and there's a wide spectrum of products out there. Um, and I think a lot of consumers struggle to kind of make sense of that world. Yeah, well, to cover the COVID stuff first, we did, a again, a survey of about a million people and looked at their COVID outcomes and whether we're taking vitamin supplements or probiotics. And virtually none of the vitamin supplements had a consistent effect uh, on preventing right, the COVID. omega three, the D. What else did you look at? Like, because there was a whole vitamin, lot about like if you're on D, C, um, you're going to be in good shape. Vitamin C, mm -hmm. garlic tablets, um, um, multivitamins. But the one that looked like it had the biggest effect was actually regular use of probiotics. This was an observational study, so it's full of potential biases and flaws. But you know, it for someone. In gut health, and I'm biased to say, well, that mm -hmm. that, that look looked like a good result for me. Um, right, I'll put that one in the but, book. But um, we did a few years ago. We did a meta-analysis for the British Medical Journal and looked at all the evidence for probiotics. Um, and there's absolutely no evidence that if you're healthy, probiotics prevent you getting disease. Okay, so for mm -hmm. the healthy person to take them regularly, probiotic capsules or or however you take them. Uh, no clear evidence for, for healthy normal people they are useful. There's some evidence that in um, chill, neonates, early young children and el the elderly, they can be beneficial. So there's some randomized trials that show they are, some are good in preventing infections or, or other problems. They also are, have shown to work in, uh, if you have, for example, some GI infections in balance, they do they do work. There's some evidence they work in uh, mild depression in randomized control trials. So mm. there are a few examples where, and this, this irritable bowel syndrome is another common. There's some evidence they work a bit in the, in these conditions. Now many people they don't work at all. It's it's not totally consistent, and a lot of this is probably because each each probiotic is different. They're protected by patents, so um, they can't be used by other companies. And our individual microbes are very different as well. So it's not surprising there's this big difference. So although we can say that many of these conditions, probiotics work, I can't say which one you should take because mm -hmm. the studies have included lots of different ones. So it's, but I think we're in a stage now where we're moving to the second, second stage of probiotics. There's some exciting ones that have come out of this new science, because all these ones are very old we're talking about, all the ones you see out there, but um, there are some new microbes like Akkermansia, um, for example, uh, is a bug that has been shown to reduce uh, blood glucose levels in trials and 
actually works just as well dead as it does alive mm. and it, it it's a very common feature in in the new in uh, all the new microbiology we're seeing so i think the next generation are going to be much better and much more designed for human health than these old ones which have just been around uh, on some company's shelf uh, with a patent for a, for a long time yeah. so so it's, it, I, I'm not giving you a very clear answer, but I think it's. Um, I still think we're much better off taking your probiotics as food than as supplements. Cause, yeah, of course. Because you're getting a bigger mix. Yeah, of course, of course. And I appreciate the 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 you know kind of respect for the complexity and, and nuance of all of this. Like you know, our human brains want that clear cut answer. Do we this. Don't fix. do that. Yeah. Give me the tablet. And uh, you're like, ah, not so fast. You know, even with each one, of the, like everything in this book, like you know, there is that layer of complexity that I think when you read it, you begin to understand like why it's so hard to even tackle this subject to begin with. Like you, how many years did you spend writing this book? Six like, years. Yeah, so. I realized why no one else you know, had done it. And it's, a, it's almost in, in this day and age, a courageous act to like dip your toe into the world of nutrition and, and make a statement, you know, because, you know, it is, it is, it is so difficult to provide kind of any actionable, you know, guidelines around it because the the science is, you know, is in many ways so in inconclusive and there's so many variables that come into play, like, you know, in terms of, and, and the personalization, you know, aspect of it that is emerging that makes it even harder to say, you should do this and not do this, right? Um, but we do have to end this podcast. So maybe we could do that with, if there are any kind of concrete, you know, rules or, or recommendations for the person who's, you know, brand new to the idea of the microbiome even being a thing and who's grappling with the idea of making, you know, healthier choices for themselves, um, you know, beyond the 30 kind of plants a week, uh, what are some other principles uh, that you could share? Because at the end of, you know, the chapters, you do kind of like bullet point, like here's some, here's some kind of clear takeaways that, I think would be helpful. So top of mind, you know, what sits atop the kind of most important of those? Well, we've covered some of them. So obviously eating the rainbow is, you know, the colors are there for a reason and they're actually really good. So, you know, don't eat beige. Yeah, um, don't eat beige. Yeah, go colorful. Um, that's, go, the, that's the title of this podcast. Go I bitter, many out, bitter yeah. things are actually good. Um, you know, one reason coffee's so healthy for you is it's got full of polyphenols and, you know, I recommend coffee over orange juice anytime as a health drink. It should be in the health section. Uh, dark chocolate's another surprising one. Cook, cook with extra virgin olive oil rather than any other oil. Don't believe all this nonsense about... Um, Heat, heating points. Yes. Yeah, the, you go into that as well. Rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, the... Um, uh, the way you eat is also important. So um, we, you know, we've we've talked um, about what to eat, but uh, time restricted eating we've discussed. We didn't discuss that actually has a really big benefit on your gut microbes. So all the studies show that if you leave a big gap um, overnight, so your your gut is rested just as the hunter-gatherer tribes did, you know, they're, they're not nibbling uh, snack bars or protein bars at night. They're, mm -hmm. you know, they're resting just as they're sleeping, giving that full circadian rhythm, real chance to real synchronize. So I think that's, that's an important part. So there's reducing the snacking time, less meals, giving yourself, you know, at least 12 hours overnight, ideally 14, is a good way for your gut to, to repair itself and enhance um, eating more slowly. Um, we all eat too fast. I think one in five American meals are consumed in the car. Mm -hmm. You know, it's difficult to have a leisurely meal in the car. Um, just you know, wait. Do you like the Mediterranean countries? You know, just don't have snacks. Wait and have a proper meal. You know, make it a social good occasion. Enjoy the food. Um, and, uh, you know, learn to try something new every, uh, every week. You should be aiming for something, something new as extra. So part of this 30 plants 
is to discover new things you haven't eaten and you know get your taste buds to try something something new all the time and introduce that to your family and make make food something exciting rather than a chore because we all get into these ruts in our choices we find something we like and we think it's healthy we have the same thing well that you know our microbes don't like that we you know they like to be tested all the time so i think it's all about an adventure experimenting find out whether you're someone who does well you know with this long overnight fast and not snacking or whether you are someone who does need to eat there are different people are you an early morning person a late morning person try skipping breakfast try changing your breakfast for you know from a high carb one to a high fat one see how you feel try and just think about how your body's working don't accept that everything's the same for everybody and i think the more we can all experiment and understand our bodies the better we get to understand food and and live with it and and always think about your food now again in these food choices if you care about the planet really think about the, those those food choices you're making because as an individual it is the number one thing we can all do uh, to save our planet beautifully put i really appreciate it um final thing before i let you go uh, would be around um, the kind of science that you would like to see being performed right now? Like, what is the study that hasn't been done yet that you feel is most important to be conducted? And, and you know, what is kind of on the nearer horizon for Zoe and the research um, that's going on there that has you excited? Well, in general, the study that will never be done would be a massive randomized control trial of ultra processed food against uh, real food and uh, pay people to do this uh, you know why can't we do that because uh, who's going to fund it who's going to fund it and uh, irras- we already know the answer though irrationally the ethics board would probably say it's unethical <laughs> to randomize one arm to the american diet and the other arm to a healthy diet um, but that's that's what we need to you know shake this up so far the study has been limited to a few weeks and uh you know we that's that's where i think i I would you know if all the money in nutrition do do that study that would um change our system and Mm -hmm. show show how bad it did for us um the zoe studies are it's evolving all the time and we're introducing all kinds of new features and giving people personalized feedbacks on whether they're dippers or not um you know should they be worried about giving we're trying to move towards giving people real-time advice about um what they should be eating uh we are just starting retesting so this is a really exciting time people can see if they've um reduced their sugar peaks and their fat peaks and they improve their gut microbiome mm-hmm. What does it look like on retest and how their gut microbes are tested and the results are looking really good on that mm. And because no one's managed to do that yet so far. And, and so using the gut microbiome is a pretty good sort of like your dental checkup that you go to every six months or so to say, how am I doing when I'm experimenting? It's quite hard to know. Um, I think we're going to start doing these citizen science projects within within the Zoe product so that We'd love several thousand people to start, you know, go on fermented foods for a month and see what the difference is. Others, um, got intermittent fasting, um, all these lifestyle interventions, I think, would be really exciting. And we, you know, want people to join in this big community. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot, there's so much stuff going on, as well as feeding back these new insights into the microbiome, maybe getting some of those microbes into as new probiotics and prebiotics, mm-hmm. because. They've never been discovered before, but they have really big effects. In our, in our data now, we see these, these huge effects of these microbes that only have names yet. And right. so um, if we can harness them, you know, they, they could be super powerful medicines as well. So, yeah, there's, there's sort of too much to... Uh, I'm, you know, a kid in a sandpit, but it's, it's full of toys, and um, it's, it's a fantastic time to be doing science. Yeah, yeah, well, I can tell it lights you up and uh, it's a really fascinating uh, new kind of emerging field. Like if I was a young medical student, this would be where I would want to 
you know, be focusing on right now because you're at the very beginning of something that clearly is only going to grow and, and, and become kind of more integral to all aspects of, 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 of human health and planetary health too. So it's really exciting. And I think the work you're doing is really important. It's inspiring. And uh, it was great to talk to you today. So thank you. Appreciate it. It's been fun.